I think one of our biggest goals as sign language interpreters is opening the world not only to the deaf but to the hearing and allowing people those experiences that they otherwise wouldn't have had access to. Well, hello and welcome to Why I'll Never Make It, a podcast featuring insightful stories and conversation with fellow artists on the realities of a career in the entertainment industry. Now, I'm your host, Patrick Oliver-Jones, and to find other episodes of Why I'll Never Make It or to get in touch with me, you can go to the website, winmepodcast.com. Now, this podcast mainly focuses on the artist, the creative, the actor or composer or director, etc. But in today's episode, I'm turning the tables and focusing on the audience, specifically those who are deaf and hard of hearing. Their access to what we do on stage is often limited, and oftentimes they can't make it to the theater because there's no way provided for them to understand what is happening. That's where sign language interpreters come in and provide access for this underserved community of theater goers. Because you see, there are more than 130 recognized sign languages worldwide, and American Sign Language is the fourth most common language in the United States. So that's why it's so important that we give sign language a voice in theater. Mairead McSweeney, director of the Deafness, Cognition, and Language Research Center at the University College London, explains the similarities and differences between signed and verbal communication. She says, quote, The first thing to understand is that signed languages are natural human languages. They evolve naturally wherever a group of deaf people need to communicate. Signed languages are fully capable of the same complexity as spoken languages, but signed and spoken languages are complex linguistic systems that simply differ in how they are expressed and perceived." And it is these differences that make sign language for theater so specialized and also so necessary. But the history of ASL interpreted shows is actually fairly young. It was not until the early 1980s that the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles would offer the first regularly scheduled ASL-interpreted performances of theater in the nation. Now, this was spurred by the forum's success with the play Children of a Lesser God in 1979, which went on to be produced on Broadway and won the Tony Award for Best Play. In fact, Children of a Lesser God had a Broadway revival a couple of years ago, and I was so grateful to have one of the actors from that play, John McGinty, on the podcast. During our conversation, he was very open about being a deaf actor and what that means to him. I don't let my deafness limit me. I think as a person who happens to be deaf, I think my job is not only to self-advocate, but to advocate for the younger generation of deaf people who are up and coming because I don't want them to go through the same struggles and frustrations that I've had to, because it's a waste of time. So I think it's our collective job as a community to keep making progress and keep moving things forward. We then talked about the themes and messages in Children of a Lesser God and how that applies to the deaf community, but also to sign language interpretation. For example, schools for the deaf today, oftentimes, Hearing teachers who don't know sign language are still teaching in those institutions, and it's an impediment to their education and their language acquisition. So I think that's a theme in Children of a Lesser God. My character was fighting for deaf students to have equal rights to education, have deaf people teaching deaf children, because it makes a big difference. And it's still relevant today. Sometimes in situations with interpreters, where interpreters are required for access, even still today, we get people who push back and say, oh, well, we don't need an interpreter. We don't have to provide an interpreter because whatever. It's a right. It's my right. As I was putting together this episode, I contacted John again and asked him about the importance of ASL interpreted shows. He told me, quote, it is imperative to show that audiences prefer the personal aspect that a great certified language interpreter can bring to a theater performance. It helps build a family and a sense of belonging in the audience for those who happen to be deaf and hard of hearing. Also, once the audience sees that the show is interpreted, they will be able to leave and say, hey, 
I saw a show that was interpreted. This will at least build a foundation and awareness of the deaf and hard of hearing community in the future. Unquote. For more information about John McGinty and our conversation together, look in the show notes for a link to that episode. As it turns out, John actually got his start in theater at the Deaf West Theater Company in Los Angeles. Their artistic director, David Kurz, replied back to an email I sent him and told me, quote, Our performances are also attended by people who have never met a deaf person, and it is my belief that placing deaf and hearing people together for two hours in a dark theater creates a unifying effect like no other, unquote. Recently, one of our Footloose shows here on Norwegian Cruise Lines was ASL interpreted by two women who travel to many different events and venues to provide sign language interpretation. Hi, I'm Heidi Johnson. And I'm Mia Engel. I will say, in all my years aboard ships, I've never seen ASL done for any show. So it was a real honor to be a part of that night's presentation. And it was an even bigger pleasure to sit down with these two interpreters and talk about the important work that they do. All right, ladies, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. It's really a thrill to have you both here. And I just want to start off, I think, with a question that all of us actors have, especially when we have sign language interpreters in front of us on stage. What is it that you rely most upon? Us actors getting the lines right, or are you just looking at the script to do it that way? I believe it's a bit of both, because we, we've looked at the script beforehand, so we know a little bit about what's in the script. But uh, during the production, I, I rely a lot on your emotions, what you convey in the words themselves, and not just in the words on the page. I think it's a common misunderstanding that sign language is only word for word what spoken English is, but actually we're interpreting for meaning. And so to listen to the meaning that's going on and being said on stage and then to recreate that meaning um, visually is what we're doing in real time. So what is it like to portray or, or take on the character of people on stage? Because there's only two of you, but there's 25 of us. So how, how, how does that work exactly? Right. Well, it, we we came through a really interesting process where we tried to figure out, well, how are we going to do this with, with all the different characters, especially since we don't know the voices of who's speaking often. And we, we kind of came up with a mix of, uh, you took Ren and I took Shaw. And uh, whenever they spoke, we kind of took over that character. But then other than that, we kind of did you, she did the boys, and I did the girls. <laughs> Otherwise, especially since we only had one day to get the script, watch the play, go through it a little bit, and then actually produce it, we had to do it really quickly. Um, I would also say that knowing the character's emotions and being able to take that on is really important, and then to um, understand what the ultimate goal of that person is um, helps us to be able to then turn around and give it out. So sometimes, um, like specifically with Ren, the body language that I would use would be different than if I were to be a different character. Um, And so to be able to portray that while I'm delivering the lines that are being said also helps um, for a deaf person to be able to visually see that representation um, in a different way. Because it's not so much about what your hands are doing, it's the full facial expression and and the body and how you interpret the character as well. It's everything. It's everything. Have both of you had acting training? Is that something that's in your background? I've had very little. And I've I've been in only maybe a handful of plays growing up, mostly when I was younger. But as a sign language interpreter, uh, we, we learn a lot about prosody. So a lot of our, our facial expressions are related to grammar, but also your body, everything has to show the meaning as well. So it is a, a lot of acting. And, and even more so in, when you're interpreting play as opposed to a board meeting. But <laughs> you, you do have to portray that. Think how would I how would I show all of this and actually feel it inside as you portray it? Now there was a word Heidi used that you may not have recognized: prosody. It was actually something I had to look up since I'd never heard the term used before. But prosody is basically defined as the rhythmic structure 
intonation, and stress in spoken and signed languages. And it plays an essential role in the production and perception of every utterance that we make. So a lack of prosody makes it difficult to know a speaker's intent or emotion. And in sign language, this is particularly important because even though an audience may understand the words an actor is saying, without prosody, they may not understand the actor's feelings or motivations. And so this is the double task of an ASL interpreter, to not only translate the words themselves, but actually take on the emotions and intentions of a character as well. We actually do become the characters, um, and not just for theater interpreting, but for all types of interpreting. Um, when we are interpreting the message, it becomes, I said this, I did that, if the person speaking or signing is saying, I did those things. So we really embody, literally, um, the message that's going on. That was one thing that I noticed whenever I had John McGinty on the podcast, and the interpreter was very much look at John, ask all your questions directed to him, and don't look at me as the interpreter, look at John and carry on that conversation. So it was very important that he was, as you say, a conduit for John and not himself an interpreter, basically part of the conversation. Yeah, you actually become their voice, so you become them. So that's where that all comes through. Now, what would you say is the the difference between sign language for theater? You'd mentioned it, you know, about a board meeting. You know, when you're in a corporate environment just doing a speaker as opposed to uh, sign language for the theater for acting, what would you say is the biggest difference in how you interpret those? Well, as we were discussing, as we were preparing, one of the things Mia brought up, and, and I think this is really true, is the emotional integrity trumps everything else, whereas in a board meeting, you are going more for the specific details of what's being said, of... Your, what time things are at and all of that, but, but you, you want to convey more than anything what this goal is, what the, what the feeling is, how this person's coming across on stage right there in front of the deaf person, because they are looking up and down at you and at the characters. But if you can portray that more from where they're looking at when you're signing, it helps them so much more. Also, um, if there are multiple characters speaking at the same time, like six people talking at the same time, of course, there's only two of us, so we can't um, capture all of that and convey it. But to convey that there is a cacophony happening on stage, that is something that we're able to do because we are aiming for that emotional integrity of the characters to show that they're outraged. Um, and so we can do that and then go back into the role. So rather than capturing every single word to portray what is um, the intent of the actors. And with regards to music versus dialogue, is there a different process for doing that as well? Um, music, we also are trying to portray and show the beat and the overall feeling in addition to showing the main singer's tone of voice and the words. And so there's a lot more that we have to show. Um, and so typically we show that in other ways, like tapping on our leg to show the beat. And so really, we really put that all over our body whenever we're trying to do the music. I find myself dancing when the music's going. I'm swaying with the beat. Also, uh, in this particular show, there was a song, Hero, that was great sound effects, very, very strong and powerful sound effects. And I found myself signing along with that music so that the emphasis would happen at the right time in the song. And the signs, too, with Hero as a person. And I would end the sign right when the boom happened. And I was like, okay, that was really fun. I've never signed with that much power before. <laughs> so I really enjoyed it. Now, how much training or what type of training went into learning sign language for the theater? And is it different as opposed to other interpreting that you would do? I went to Goshen College, and my final um, class there was focusing on the arts in London. And so while I was there, I actually um, focused on comparing how um, the arts were interpreted in D.C. compared to how they were interpreted in London, um, even though I don't know British sign language. So that was a really interesting experience. And I've had some other training with both hearing people and deaf people kind of giving advice and also just doing it. And so the more practice you get, it really helps. <laughs> So with regards to sign language for theater in particular, what would you say is some of the most challenging parts of interpreting that versus some of the other events or other types of uh, sign language that you do? 
I think one thing is uh, the sound. Usually when you're on a board meeting, you're sitting around a table. When you're in the theater, it's behind you. And sometimes it's harder for you to hear, especially in music. In music, it, it tends to be more artistic as well. So that adds another element. Having the audience there in front of you watching you adds a whole nother element because, like you said, you become part of the production and you want... You don't want to go up there and be, you know, stone faced and making it like, here you go, here's just the words. You you actually have to get into it. So it's, it, there's a lot of different challenges that it adds. I would say that for myself, um, to be in front of a large audience in a theater space or at a concert can really be challenging. I have never wanted to have that many eyes on me. <laughs> um, but to be in that role, you really have to take on the person who is doing the talking. And so to put yourself aside and say, I'm not me for now. I am the person who's on the stage. Um, it can be a really scary moment, but also it's what needs to be done to give equal access to everyone. And what would you say is the most exciting or enjoyable part of doing the sign language for theater? To see deaf people experiencing the exact same theater production that the hearing audience members are experiencing. To see the deaf people laughing at the same time and understanding the jokes and to be able to provide that um, is really incredible. I think there's an added element that it, it puts to any production. And I, I have felt both from the deaf and from the hearing audience, there's a, there's a deep emotional connection that, and you can tell when that person's, when the people are feeling that by, based on maybe something you signed. Cause a lot of people are watching you and they tell you that afterwards. I, I was watching you the whole time. I'm like, really? You should have been looking up at the stage, <laughs> but. But you do, you can, you can feel this emotional connection when people, when something you signed touched them. And it's more than just the whole production. It just adds that little bit more of, of emotion. We went, we actually were talking to the choreographers afterwards of the performance and they were like, it was so fun to see all that emotion going on. I was, yeah, there was tons on stage. I'm sure it was all flowing down from there through us. <laughs> It was coming from up there first. <laughs> but it's that emotional connection that you get, definitely. And you kind of touched on it earlier, but why do you think it's so important to you to have sign language for the theater available? The theater has always, I mean, it's been around as long as humans have been around, right? Storytelling is just part of who we are as people. And so that is the same no matter if you're deaf or hearing. And deaf people ought to have the choice if they would like to experience theater and like to experience what's going on on stage, they should have the opportunity to do that. I think one of our biggest goals as sign language interpreters is opening the world, not only to the deaf, but to the hearing and allowing people those experiences that they otherwise wouldn't have, have had access to. It's, it's a part of humanity. It just brings us all together in that, those moments of we all feel the same. We all, we all are getting the same stories and we bring what was from our backgrounds to those experiences. But if we didn't have access to the meaning of those things, we would, we would be lost. We need that connection of humanity. And what are some personal experiences that either of you have had with regards to audience interaction from hearing or non-hearing audiences? Every once in a while, and usually I'm not watching the audience when I'm signing at all. It's it's very distracting to me. There was one woman in the audience we both noticed that teared up at a certain point. And, uh, and seeing that, seeing people react means a lot. Um, I've interpreted a production that there were some small children attending. Um, and I think it was their first time to see a theater performance going on. For them to experience that and for me to see what was sparked in their eyes and as they were retelling the stories to each other as they walked out, um, that was a really awesome moment for me. Now, a little bit more personal about both of you. What drew you to sign language and what was it about it that made you say, you know what, this is what I want to do for a living? It is a really long story, but to make it really short, <laughs> um, there was, there was a little boy when I was a young girl who knocked on the door one day. Uh, he was selling peddling items and I had answered the door 
and went to my mom. My mom came, and I, and after she talked to him a little bit and closed the door, I asked, you know, his voice was different. Why was his voice different? And she said, well, he can't hear like you and I can. And at that moment, I had this, I really did have this feeling that someday I'm going to be working with these people. And um, then I... I went to school, was taking a woods class, found I could lose my fingers. And I'm like, I'm out of here. Found out my friends were in a sign language class, transferred over to that. But I just kept going at it through college as well, took it instead of math. <laughs> and then as time just went on, I just found myself falling into this. I was actually going to be a vocal performance major. Every time auditions came around, I couldn't sing. I was so sick. I was like, this isn't meant to be. But I, it just flowed into it. And it's actually become a real passion for me. And like I said, in opening, opening worlds for people, meeting people, working with people in a way that otherwise I wouldn't have been able to. When I was 12 years old, I met a six-year-old little deaf boy. Um, he was a deaf Amish little boy. And I was like, oh, this is fascinating. Um, there was an interpreter present, and for about two weeks every day, I would be like, hey, Mr. Interpreter, tell him this, tell him that. Um, and finally, after two weeks, I was like, hold up, wait, <laughs> I want to know how to do this. So um, the interpreter started to teach me, and eventually the deaf Amish boy's family, um, they were half deaf, half hearing, and so there was tons of language being used in the home. Um, and eventually they welcomed me to come visit their home, which was a really big deal as an English person. That was the start of it. So by the time I was 14, I was like, wait, I can get paid to chat with deaf people all day long? <laughs> this is it. I'm, I'm signing, like, sign me up right now. Um, of course, it's not just chatting with deaf people all day long, but at the time I was sold. Um, so eventually I went to college for it and, I think the element that keeps me intrigued, um, not only the human aspect of it, but also I love cultures and languages, and every day I get to play with how do I convey this meaning in a way that honors the spirit and the intent of what the, the person was saying. I'm curious about how much, whenever you interpret, how much individuality comes out like does your individuality come out or as you said you just take upon whatever emotion whatever that person is going through and yourself you as the interpreter kind of gets lost in that we often do get lost uh there is a there is a huge amount of individuality too i would say in that the way we sign certain things the way we, the way we can use it's a very creative language the way we can use what they're saying and just put it into this beautiful picture of sign language, whether it's more visual or a certain little tweak with our eye to play with it. Like if someone would say, oh, that was creepy. The look we give at the deaf person, this is creepy, you know, <laughs> but you know, just we, we can play with it a lot. And I have had deaf people look at, look at the person behind me and then look at me and like, you look just like he's talking and he, I know you can't hear him, but you can see him. You can see me and we're matching affect. And that's a, that's a really positive moment. So it is, it's a lot of acting, but it's a lot of personal creation in in what we're doing too, which I enjoy. I would say it's similar to what an actor does. Um, we all might have the same script that we're working from, but how we deliver what, um, what that line is, is going to be different. And we all have our own accent. We all have our own way of signing. Um, but overall, the intent is that the, the message is still the same no matter who gives it. At this point, now that you've been, basically this has been your life, your career, uh, what do you enjoy most about it? Well, I'd say it's almost like being a fly on the wall, but you're not because you're right in the situation. And so it's, it's a very special place in the world where you're able to walk into people's lives and be just for a small moment, be part of their lives, their interaction and the, and and then you leave. And so the little things that you get to see along the way, the the um, the emotions, the feelings, the moments where you just get this view of humanity that you otherwise you you just wouldn't see. Like people people crying at the eye doctor because they have have to get a procedure done or people in the hospital, people people at school doing their schoolwork and and their their interactions with their other students and their struggles, you see you see it all. You see everything. So it's it's a neat perspective perspective of the world. 
we truly are there for the best and the worst of times in someone's life. Um, and that's a huge privilege. I love the human interaction that I get to experience. Um, it might not be my interaction. I'm just um, the person conveying that interaction. But it is really beautiful to be able to make those connections. And like I said, to be able to play with the language and to do cultural mediation, it's amazing. And uh, last question. So when it comes to theater, is there a particular show that you would love to interpret or a show that you would love to be a part of? Well, because I love the show, I would say Wicked. <laughs> but Footloose actually was amazing. Like I said, that hero song, I'm, I'm never going to forget that moment of hero boom. <laughs> So, but yeah, wicked or yeah, there's so there's so many things. I don't know. There's there's so many options out there that would be would be fun and fascinating for all different reasons. I don't. I really don't. It's like trying to pick your favorite child or like pick your favorite book. How does one do that? Every time I get to do something, it's really a special moment. Yeah. And so, do you prefer musicals over plays? Um, I probably prefer to interpret concerts or musicals, but, um, theater in itself is so amazing. And so anytime I get to do an incredible performance, it's, it feels good at the end of the day. Again, thank you so much for shedding light on something that us as actors, we kind of see from afar off to the distance if you're on stage, but thank you for kind of opening our eyes to, to what this process is like. Thanks. Thank you so much. As we continue to push for more diversity and inclusivity in the arts, we need to focus not only on those on stage and on screen, but also on the audiences that come to see us and making sure that they have all the access they need to enjoy and appreciate the world of theater and storytelling. John McGinty mentioned in our emails back and forth that we need to make sure every show is at least interpreted. Have that conversation with your artistic director or producer. Promote the use of ASL and reach out to the deaf and hard of hearing communities so you can share the event with them. The theater community is large and it is strong, so let's make sure everyone has a voice in it, whether spoken or signed. Special thanks goes to BrainFacts.org, HowlRound.com, John McGinty, David Kurz, and Mared McSweeney for their contributions to this episode. For more information on the people and topics discussed today, check out the show notes for web links and further details. If there's anyone you know who could benefit and learn from today's episode, please share it with them using the link listen.winmepodcast.com. Join me next week when I'll be talking to Jackie Vanderbeck, founder and producing artistic director of Sing for Your Seniors. It's a two-part look at this very special organization and its founder. I can't wait to talk to you again on Why I'll Never Make It. I do have one funny story to share that I thought of. Uh, we there's so public events we can talk about. There was a, a Smithsonian Folklife Festival that happens in DC every year, and one year it was a Pete Seeger concert, and one of the songs happened to be Abi Yo Yo. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's it's from Reading Rainbow. It's a story of a monster who goes into an, a community and eats all the sheep. Okay. This was my childhood nightmare. I I dreamt of this monster so many times, and it always ended the same way of me hiding under my bed. So I turned to the other interpreter. I said, I am so sorry. I cannot interpret this song at all. And she got up there. She did a wonderful job, but I just knew I couldn't let that song go through me. <laughs> And I had to back off. <laughs> and that we have to do that sometimes as interpreters because, like we said, it is a personal, you take it on yourself. And um, there is vicarious trauma that happens with interpreting. And I was like, that is one moment I am totally backing off. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, you're still a person and you're going to react to certain things. And maybe you can't interpret that because it would it would wreck you or, or oh, it'd scare you. It would wreck me. <laughs> Even years later, I was like, I'm so sorry that no, can't do it.